I think that I'm not unusual in taking my mother for granted. That is to say, I, she was my mother, I loved her, she was very special to me, but I don't think I quite realized that she was special to a lot of other people as well. Several years ago, my brother Andy and I started talking with Mary about, I mean, this was several years ago when she was still only about 90. <laughs> and uh, and uh, about where she should live. And should she stay here in Tucson or should she come live near one of us, my brother in California and myself in Massachusetts, and be closer not only to us but to her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. At that point, there was only one, an infant. Now there are nine. That, uh, But Mary, while she recognized the benefits of living near one of us, uh, it was very clear she was going to stay here in Tucson. Uh, Tucson was her home. And she was very clear that a home was not a city, it was not a house, it was her friends. And here she was so deeply engaged with so many of you here today and people who couldn't make it today that she felt this is where she wanted to stay. Uh, and it worked out very well. Uh, you and others kept her engaged, kept her involved, and I think we literally or at least almost literally kept her alive. Uh, that, uh, I don't know what the scientific evidence, but there seems to be wide consensus that staying active, having friends, being socially engaged keeps people alive longer in most cases than would otherwise be the case. So thank you very much for that. I find it interesting to ask the question of why it was that my mother affected so many other people and had so many friends throughout her life, but particularly in the last decades of her life. And in talking about this with my wife Marjorie, I, it struck me, largely from what she said, that there were two things that stood out. One was that Mary was always interested in other people. She asked questions all the time of other people. That those of you who took care of her, in, especially in the last year or two, know that she knew all about you. Uh, she had many questions to ask. I think that Mary would have made a very good anthropologist uh, in, in that regard. And the interest she showed in other people, which was a sincere interest, was important in her connections. The other thing is that Mary tried to live by her principles of being a frugal person in a peace keeper, peace carer in many sense. And there's a song that Clyde Appleton, who couldn't be here today, that Clyde sang on the record uh, that was put out oh, 50 years ago to raise money for the case, and I'll come back to the case in, in, a little later, uh, where the line that I remember is, I'm going, to, I'm going to lead the life I sing about in my songs. Well, Mary was not a singer. She was a talker, as you know. And I think that she certainly tried and to lead the life she talked about. And people saw that and cared about it, I think. There are many people who, and many groups that I want to explicitly thank for all you gave to Mary over the years. I'm not going to try to name all the individuals, but in naming the groups of people, it tells you something about Mary. There, there, first of all, was, in many years, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, there, 
where the people from care coordinators that took care of her, especially during the last year, but really for several years, were engaged with her. There were Mary's neighbors. She took her walks until the last year. Mary was walking around the big block on where her house was every day. She couldn't do it in, in the last year, but she made lots of friends from that walk. Lend a hand. That the, I guess it's a neighborhood-based organization that helps people in various ways. And one of the ways they helped us right here at the end was connecting us to this church. But they helped Mary in many ways, taking her to appointments uh, and helping her in that manner. The Tucson Peace Center, which she was a part for many years, and the larger Tucson Peace and Justice, Peace and Freedom community. And of course, there was the Thursday lunch group, a group of old friends that still do, and for many years, I don't know how many years, I met every Thursday for lunch at Furs over near St. Mary's. And one of the signs that Mary was in serious difficulties when she just found it too difficult to get to the Thursday lunch. That, that was, I think, one of the things that marked change in her life. And then there were many more friends that she had uh, far and wide here in Tucson and beyond. Now today, what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to show you some pictures and tell you a few stories about Mary's life. Uh, and then a few other people, a couple of my daughters, uh, Mary's grandchildren, have things they want to say. Uh, and then Barbara Elfbrand, who's known Mary just about as long as anybody in Tucson, I expect, uh, is going to say something. And Mary Ann Clark, uh, a good friend for many years, I, and then Stephanie Keenan, who's known Mary through the Inter Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And then the Raging Grannies, who sang at her 100th birthday, are going to sing one more time for Mary. So let me I tell you, as I said before some of you came in, the lines up here are the last lines from Mary's undergraduate honors thesis that she did in college. Mary Somerville Grossman became later Mary McEwen. I, and I thought that in many ways they bring out the point of Mary's concern for trying to help other people, for trying to do the right thing with regard to society and taking a responsibility uh, beyond herself and beyond her family, as important as her family was to her. This is a picture of Mary at about six or seven years old. And there are a couple of things that stand out at that particular point in Mary's life, and these stand out in the memory of the stories that I've heard. One is that at that point, she marched in for women's suffrage along with her mother and her twin sister at that point. Uh, it was, I, from what I know, her first political engagement. Uh, <laughs> but the start of many, as you know. But there's another story from that period that I, I, I it must have been about the same time that picture was taken that uh, I like to tell, that I, that was when Mary's mother was shot in the leg in the leg. I, 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 had what it, I think it's a, a good argument, perhaps, for gun control or something. I, what it was, was Armistice Day in World War I. And my grandfather called her up from his office downtown and said, come on downtown, we're celebrating. So she went out to catch a trolley, and while she was standing, waiting for the trolley, she got shot in the leg by somebody shooting off a gun to celebrate. Uh, she was all right. Uh, and, uh, was fine. But it's, it must have had an effect on Mary and her young sister at that time. Uh, and the sequel to the story is uh, 20 years later, Mary was introduced to a man at the party. She knew the name of the, the who was a boy at that time who had fired the shot. 
And she said, oh, you're the man who shot my mother. <laughs> At which point the man, she said, he almost faded. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, I showed, this is Mary and her, uh, her twin sister, Mary on the far side there, when they were about 12 or 13. And I show this picture even though the quality of it isn't too good, because Mary and her twin sister dressed the same every day. And they dressed the same every day through their first year in college. And then in the beginning of her second year in college, the dean called Mary in. I think she called Mary in, not her sister as well and said she didn't think maybe it was a good, not such a good idea for them to dress the same every day. Uh, it, it was, uh, when I heard that story, uh, I didn't quite know what to think, but Mary was called in. This is Mary when she entered college at 19, or right about the time she entered college, yeah, maybe 18 yeah, at, at that time. I, now, the when Mary finished college four years later, shortly, within months after she and her sister had finished college, their father died. Uh, and the, uh, shortly after that, a year later, somewhere in the next year, uh, her mother took her twin daughters on this trip to uh, the British Isles, to, they had various relatives in the British Isles. And in Ireland, they were invited to lunch at the home of some distant relative, and Mary was seated next to a British admiral who turned to her at one point and said, don't you find the Irish peasants beasts? <laughs> and when I heard this story, I said, well, what did you say? She said, I don't know what to say. <laughs> and that, but it does tell you a little bit about the, um, the background of the Irish-English relationship uh, that, uh, that was going on had deep roots. But don't you find the Irish peasants beasts? Uh, it's always a, a story I remember. In the mid-30s, Mary, on the far side there, and her sister became involved in the co the consumer co-op movement. Right? And they, were in, they lived in St. Louis. I uh, were active in the co in the co-op movement. And this this picture behind the co-op sign, and this picture of delivering of gasoline. I don't think they drove the trucks. That's Mary on the running board, her sister in the sign. I uh, that, uh, but it was very important uh, for many reasons. But also that the way my father told it is that he got interested in the consumers co-op because he heard that there were some nice girls there, <laughs> and sure enough. Uh, the next year, or shortly after that, 1937, my parents were married, and I, I always thought this picture, uh, in my mind, was uh, a little ridiculous, but I, it, a nice picture, non nonetheless, of them shortly after they were married. Now, those of you who knew Mary well might know that, from Mary's perspective, what was important in forming people's social and political outlook was how they were raised as young children. And that uh, my brother and I were the beneficiaries of that. I, for better or for worse, we were the beneficiaries of it. I, that, that's my brother, as one of the kids said when he saw, saw this picture, and they said, oh, that's Andy, because he still wears suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> and that's me, this, this was the summer of 1942. And recently, recently, uh, by recently, I mean in the last five years, Mary told me when she was irritated at me for not telling her something that Marjorie, my wife, had told her, she said, you know, you were supposed to be a girl. <laughs> and this was a very strange feeling. Uh, but also what came out at that point was that if it hadn't been for World War II, they almost certainly would have had more children uh, that time. Uh, I was born in the spring of 1942, I, and the, the future at that point was viewed very uncertain. My father was a conscientious objector, I, and they, at this point, were farming, because being farming, 
farmers. They, he was not put in a CO camp at, at that point. Uh, and of course, the part of the story is that they were both city kids. Uh, they'd grown up in St. Louis in the city and knew virtually nothing about farming. Uh, the, 30 years later, a lot of people went back to the earth, as it were, but this was not part of any general movement, as long as I know. So they got a book. Uh, <laughs> and the book told them how to do farming. Uh, and uh, I'll come back to this, that's the what about girls was the, the, the issue I already mentioned. I'll come back to the co-ops in a moment. Uh, the book told them what to do in various circumstances. And indeed, uh, this was just outside St. Louis. It was a cold winter and uh, they had piglets. And the piglets were frozen stiff in the morning. Uh, but don't fret, don't fret. Uh, they went and looked in the book. <laughs> and the book, said, the book said, what you do is you get a tub of hot water and you dunk the piglets in it, keeping their snouts out of the water. And so that's what they did, and sure enough, <laughs> the piglets came back to life, as it were. We don't know about neurological damage, but uh, there, was, there were no tests. But, uh, so they did, they did learn something. During the war, uh, we went around to, to various co-ops. I, I really don't remember this, uh, but I, my parents made arrangements to, to join a agricultural cooperative in Northern California. And it all arranged that we joined this co-op. They sent all their worldly possessions out there. We drove across the country. And we got there, and the person that they made the arrangements with had been deposed. And the co-op was now making so much money off the war that they didn't want any new members. Uh, so you could imagine that Alan and Mary were, were soured on co-ops uh, for, for a long time. Uh, and of course, that is one of the problems with co-ops, is that they can operate that way. They don't necessarily, but uh, that, that was certainly one of the issues. Uh, and then, these, these are some other pictures. These are my parents in the early 60s, I think. The picture of Mary is a uh, passport picture, because they were going to what was then British Guyana, uh, where my father taught in the newly created university there. I, and I, I'm not sure, I found this picture along with the other, and I knew it was about the same time, but I, I'm not sure the picture of my father, what it was for. And this is my mother in British Guyana in 1963-64, when they were there, and I, I just thought it was a nice picture to include at this point. They came back to the States, uh, and if you sort of passed through Cambridge, where we were living, and my father had a job in Canada, and this was just before they left. Uh, to, for my father to take on a job there. And then this is just, I thought, a very nice picture of Mary taken in 1975 uh, that I wanted to include. Uh, this was at the celebration of my parents' 50th wedding anniversary in 1987. I, I didn't fully appreciate it at the time, but looking back, I can see that development of my father's decline, and he died uh, roughly a year, a year later in 88. Uh, in, uh, and that's myself and my brother. Uh, both of us had more hair at that point, but uh, <laughs> that's uh, still us. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier on was Mary's frugality. I, and uh, I can't speak for Andy, but I inherited a lot of that and I take a good deal of ribbing and I, for various friends and my children, I, and I claim that I came by it honestly, at least. But one of the aspects of that was all my life, Mary at home, Mary cut my hair, cut my brother's hair, cut Alan's hair, and he cut her hair. But when Alan was uh, gone, I, this fell to Andy and me. That's Andy cutting Mary's hair outside her house. As far as I know, Mary never had her hair cut professionally. When we couldn't get there at various times, Susan Thorpe did it, Mariana did it, I think, at least once. Uh, and, but that was part of her frugality. Uh, that, 
In 2001, the Tucson chapter, as many of you know, named her as Woman of Courage. Uh, this was the program, and those are pictures of her speaking at the dinner that, that went on. This was in, in 2001. This is about the same time, uh, a picture of myself and my brother and, and Mary. Uh, and at that point, another Mary started to learn to use a computer, and my sister-in-law, Susan, was her, her main teacher. Uh, and this is Susan leaning over teaching Mary how to use her first computer. Uh, and for a while, she we used email, and it was very convenient. There was no doubt about that. Uh, then I mentioned the Thursday, the Thursday lunch. Uh, this is a picture of the Thursday lunch. As many of you recognize in particular, uh, that down on the end of the far is Barb Elfrand. Next to her is Clyde Appleton. And I mentioned the case. Uh, Barbara and Clyde and Barbara's then husband uh, did not sign the loyalty oath. And they were all teachers. It was high school, wasn't it, that you were all teaching? Uh, and they had to be employed if you had to sign the loyalty oath in the schools. Uh, and Mary and Alan were among their supporters, uh, which Vern, I, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but if were, Vern, Vern he kept it working, but Barbara and Clyde didn't have jobs. And the case went to the Supreme Court, and Ed Morgan handled the case, and they won. Uh, hey. it, it was, <laughs> We don't always win, but we won that one. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, that was one of, and then this is a number, another picture of the Thursday lunch with various friends at, at first, which was a very important part of Mary's life for many years. Mary on the right there. Uh, now, another important part of Mary's life was listening to Democracy Now! Uh, the, radio, the progressive uh, radio news broadcast. Uh, done by Amy Goodman, uh, and Amy Goodman, when she came to Tucson, uh, was one of the people connected to Democracy Now! was Jeremy Scahill, who's written some important, some important books on U.S. foreign policy and military actions. And these are pictures first with, with Jeremy Scahill, then talking to Amy, and then making her point yes. to Amy Goodman, down, down there on the lower left. Uh, and she very much enjoyed that day. Then, uh, 10 years ago, now, now there was one more great-grandson. Uh, we had this gathering here in Tucson of all her, her family at that point, which has grown a good deal since then. Uh, and as I said, the kids were very important to Mary. Uh, there, three of her great-grandchildren were born within roughly a month of each other. And, uh, the, the, the two older boys, and the, you can't quite tell, but two of those little ones are girls and one's a boy. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't have a picture of the whole group of her nine, but I had to include them. So these are the twins that came later, and, and, uh, and then the youngest, just after she was born three years ago, three and a half years ago, uh, Lily is her other uh, great. Great then I have a series. This, this was 2011. Then 2012. Many of you were there when Mary was cutting the cake of her 100th birthday party, uh, which was this end. And then this is Mary at the uh, a luncheon in Tucson each year for people who are over 100. Uh, I'm not it's a council on aging. He runs this, or I'm not sure that's the right organization. And they took this picture. But this is Mary uh, a year ago, Christmas, uh, when she wasn't able to walk herself around the block. So we took her, and her caretakers took her. We were visiting, and when I, when I took this picture, my wife and I, with Mary, and we liked the hat. Uh, that, that, uh, and then this is the last picture we have of Mary uh, from uh, her 103rd birthday. And that she was able to celebrate her, part, her 103rd birthday. 
right? She wasn't just there. She had to go lie down at various times, but she appreciated it. It was important. You see the food behind her. Many friends came, uh, and she was still there. That, uh, and this was only three weeks before she died. I, and that, that is the last picture we have of her. I thought I would end this little show with uh, some quotes from the article that was written in the Star uh, in 2003. I, and you can read it, we'll be reading to you. At 91, Mary McEwen has attended more marches, rallies, protests than she can possibly remember. It's not that her memory is failing. It's because these life this lifelong advocate has raised her voice and hoisted placards pleading for peace countless times. If you bring up children right, I mentioned this earlier, if you bring up children right, they will end up being pacifists, she said. I don't get depressed. An awful lot of people do. I'm lucky. I guess it's my personality, said McEwen, engaging and modest. And I thought that was a nice, a nice place to end this little tale through Mary's life. What I we're going to do now is two of my daughters, two of Mary's granddaughters, want to say something. Carl and Annie, you want to come up here?